There he was laying in the fetal position, dead. A mother's heartbreak at the hands of the opioid crisis. My life at that moment stopped. Identity theft can happen to any of us. Found credit cards that I did not apply for in the mailbox. How this woman fought back. My name pretty much is on everything and I'm, I'm gonna be the one to left hole in the way. How a plan to earn extra money landed him in a mortgage fraud scheme. Fraud is everywhere. What you need to know to protect yourself in Consumer Alert after the crime. Hi, I'm Terry Serpico, and I have the honor of playing a United States Postal Inspector on TV. On our show, we investigate crimes perpetrated through the mail. And one thing I've learned is that now, more than ever, Consumers need to be on alert as con men find sophisticated new ways to try and beat the system. Identity theft, mail fraud, foreign lottery scams. Thieves are constantly upping the ante on how to steal your money. Consumer Alert has profiled over 500 real crimes against real victims who are now working to rebuild their lives. We will show you how the thieves do it and how you can protect yourself and your family. More than 15 million consumers in the U.S. were victims of identity theft last year, to the tune of $16 billion, and the numbers are only going up. Meet one woman who had her personal information compromised, but turned the tables on the thief. I found credit cards that I did not apply for in the mailbox. Sissy Johnson knew something was wrong, so she began making calls. Went to the credit union and found out that I not only had uh, credit cards and bank accounts and checking accounts, savings, uh, lines of credit. The situation was even worse. Her DMV account had been hacked, she had multiple car loans, and even corporations created in her name. The person who stole my identity bailed somebody out of jail twice. So when a bail bondsman called asking for money because a suspect didn't appear in court, she got an idea. Sissy turned the tables on the thieves who were wreaking havoc on her life. I found him on Facebook, and then I created a Facebook profile in his name, and then friend requested all his family and friends, and then wrote on post everything he had done to me. She quickly got his attention. He called me in a panic, saying, please take it down. My mom doesn't know, my family doesn't know that I've been to jail and all this stuff. And I said, well, who bailed you out of jail? And he said, I can't remember. And I go, well, then I can't remember my password. Eventually, she got the names and went to authorities. Turns out they were ringleaders of multiple fraud and identity theft schemes that stole over $2 million. Essentially, this case um, involved bank fraud, identity theft, involved account takeovers, it involved um, the stealing of large corporate checks, the theft of personal checks, all from a large national bank. An employee who worked for the bank stole the personal information of clients. In this case, there was no prevention of the fraud. However, containing the damage was essential. The victims who kept the closest tabs on their checking account, who checked it the most often, those were the ones who were able to minimize the damage. You lock your doors to your house because, you know, you want to keep that secure. Freeze your credit. It takes 10 minutes. You're like, well, it's not convenient. What if I want credit on the fly? It's going to take you 15 minutes to unfreeze your credit. It's going to take you two years to undo what they've done. Here are a few things you can do to protect your credit. Review your credit reports every four months. Each of the three major credit agencies offer free credit reports once a year. Shred and destroy documents that contain personal information. And don't leave your mail in your mailbox overnight or while you're on vacation. We've all heard the saying, make your money work for you, which is why so many consumers are looking for investment opportunities. All investments come with a degree of risk. There's no such thing as guaranteed returns or no risk investments. And as you're about to see, one man who dreamed of flipping real estate and making easy profits learned this lesson the hard way. Would you buy this house? Derek Suggs mistakenly did so after getting caught up in an elaborate mortgage fraud scam. I just started looking at myself and saying, you didn't do your due diligence, so now you have to figure your way out of this. Derek admits he made some rookie mistakes when he decided to try and make money by managing properties. He and a friend thought they could buy houses, manage them, and share in the profit. Initially, his contribution would only be his good credit. 
and he wouldn't have to put any money up front. That business model made sense. The postal inspectors say Derek and his friend were set up to fail once they met Larry Graham and Sylvia Cathy. She purchased properties and then she would resell them within a few months for a greatly increased um, profit. How could she do this? False information provided by her appraiser partner, Larry Graham. He would inflate the values of the properties so that they would look more appealing to the banks to approve the loans. Based on fraudulent documents, Derek Suggs bought 12 properties at inflated prices that were basically uninhabitable. My name pretty much is on everything, and I'm, I'm going to be the one to left hole in the way. As banks and creditors began calling, he got scared. When I was thinking about, you know, being in debt, now I'm thinking about a federal crime because now it seems like I have created some fraudulent documents. And at that time, that's when I knew I had been taken for a ride. Postal inspectors say the best advice for any and every investment, do your research. Before you buy, go look at the house that you're supposed to be investing in. And if the investors would have gone and looked at the properties, they would have noticed some significant issues with what they were told versus what they found. Postal inspectors say you should never trust a recommendation from friends or family without doing research yourself. A few good sources are the Better Business Bureau, your state's attorney general, or even an online search. Law enforcement says the opioid drug crisis in America is reaching epidemic proportions. In fact, more people now die from overdoses than from car accidents. And drug users no longer know the content of the drugs they're taking. And now, it's a life or death decision. One mother's painful story has become a crusade to start a national discussion on drugs. Opened up the door, and there he was laying in the fetal position, dead. My life at that moment stopped. Peggy Hernandez lost her son, Ty, to a drug overdose. He was just 23. Seeing the child you brought into this world laying there lifeless and blue and cold, it's the worst feeling for a mother to ever go through. That's not the way it's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to go first. Ty had just moved back home after a breakup. He smoked pot from time to time, and that was something Peggy and her husband would not tolerate. He was on lockdown. He wasn't able to go anywhere, couldn't go see any of his old friends, nothing. This was a change of life. He got a new job and was saving money. His parents thought everything was going well. So they were stunned when he didn't come down for breakfast one morning. Knocking on the door, saying, calling his name. Nobody was coming to the door. Peggy couldn't believe what detectives found when they came to the house. He doesn't do heroin. The only thing this kid ever did was marijuana. And they go, no, ma'am, this is heroin. This is what it looks like. The autopsy showed the heroin Ty smoked was laced with the powerful painkiller, fentanyl. He was dead the moment he took the first inhale. My son was executed. Well, it's extremely potent on the central nervous system, and it causes your breathing to slow down to, to the point where you can die. Experts say the rise of the powerful painkiller is reaching epidemic proportions. At the Postal Inspection Service's National Forensics Laboratory, chemists analyze the content of questionable packages or items seized in an investigation. They know firsthand the frightening effects of fentanyl. A small amount ingested or absorbed through your skin can kill you. Some of the victims that they have found that were injecting what they thought was heroin turned out to be fentanyl. They, found, they, they were found with the needles in their arms and barely depressed. In, so they had hardly put anything into their system, and they were dead. Is that powerful? Peggy admits her son had an addiction, but she says he wasn't buying a death sentence. The uh, drug dealer was still sending text messages 
to Mr. Hernandez, who had passed away, and his parents saw the text messages because he wanted to get paid. Those text messages led officials straight to the drug dealer who sold Ty the drugs. This is a landmark case. For the first time, a federal jury convicted a dealer for selling the drugs that killed someone. The Hernandez family is not celebrating the conviction. Instead, they want to prompt a national discussion about why so many kids are turning to drug use and its deadly effects. We have to show different children different ways to handle stress using different tools. Because she hopes no one has to share the pain she feels. That last hug that we had upstairs the night before, it's the last hug I'll have. And I hold on to it every day. Norman Breidenbaugh's wife was dying of cancer, but when he was told he had won a lottery, he thought his luck was changing. He was wrong. They're called porch poachers, thieves who brazenly steal packages off front doors. We'll show you how to protect your purchases next on Consumer Alert After the Crime. If my telling my story keeps somebody else from getting in this kind of trouble, then that's all I need. Norman Breidenbaugh is one of thousands of older Americans who lost his life savings in a foreign lottery scam. Postal inspectors say that more than a billion dollars a year is being funneled out of our country in these schemes. These criminals tend to prey on vulnerable seniors and the toll is devastating. And I made the sign over the door. Riding balls established 1986. Norman Bridenbaugh is understandably upset. As he looks at the home he shared with his wife for 22 years, he lost the home to foreclosure in a scam that started with a phone call. They told her she wanted two and a half million dollar sweepstakes. At first, the scammer told him to send $2,000 to pay for taxes on the winnings. After he agreed, they started asking questions. They get information from you, and then they take that information and turn it around and use it against you. Like the fact that his wife, Lucinda, was in a nursing home dying of cancer. Well, if, if I just sent them this money, then I would get their sweepstakes, and I would have money then to bring her home. Desperate to make that happen, Norman refinanced his house and continued to send payments as the crooks strung him along. In the end, he not only lost his wife to cancer, he was also out $400,000 and his home. It's really uh, sad and disgusting that you know, someone is, is taking that much from, from someone who's worked so hard. U.S. Postal inspectors are working Norman's case, but the crooks are not easy to track down and they often run their scams from outside the U.S. There are more than 60,000 cases of mail fraud every year. Investigators say it's important to look for these warning signs. The easiest uh, red flag to recognize in a lottery or sweepstakes scam is if you have to send money to claim your winnings, it's a fraud. Uh, there's no legitimate sweepstakes or lottery that actually asks you to send money to pay for your taxes. So, how can you make sure your loved ones don't fall victim to these scams? One daughter found ways to break the cycle and prove to her mother that these offers were too good to be true. So they were just trying to destroy her in so many ways. Valerie is talking about her mother, who got caught up in a lottery sweepstakes scam a few years before she died. The 83-year-old was told she had won $20 million, but to collect her winnings, she needed to pay the taxes. So she began to send money. I actually have handled her financial affairs for many years. And so I would just periodically look at her accounts and just kind of see, and I kept seeing unusual activities. So Valerie spoke to the bank, who helped her keep tabs on what her mother was doing financially. The banker would periodically call me and say, your mom has um, just came in and she has cashed a check for $1,000 in cash. Valerie tried to intervene, 
but it always turned into an argument. I was just always the bad guy in the sense. So I was always the one that was saying no, instead of allowing her to be her own individual. I was, I was very angry, hurt, that someone could take away that from my loved one. Valerie and her family began to change their approach. We got her an iPad, and we were able to give her luminosity and some things that were able to help her give her that same thrill without being a risk to someone victimizing her. Her other goal was to get her mother out of the house. I would get her involved in things. Um, at 83 years old, she had never swum in her life, and she actually started swimming in a pool until the day she passed away. Valerie realized her mother got in trouble when she had too much time alone. If you can get involved in the community and just be a part of it, I think that will be another way of getting them away from the bad guy. But once Valerie and local postal inspectors got involved, her mother began to realize she was being scammed. Statistically, we found that if you're between the ages of 55 and 64, you are twice as likely to fall for a scam like this. And once you hit 65, you're three times as likely to fall for this type of scam. Even though my mom has passed, I'm going to be her advocate for the next elder who has been victimized. Are your online deliveries safe? We'll show you how to turn the tables on so-called porch poachers when we return. Porch poachers, brazen thieves who walk right up to your front door and steal packages. Many consumers have started setting up their own home surveillance cameras to catch the criminals. Experts say it's a crime of opportunity. People have been coming in and taking people's packages in the building frequently. Trevor Doherty says he had two packages stolen from the front foyer of his apartment building. His building has two doors. The first one into the foyer is unlocked. Packages are often left there. I was waiting to receive a jacket and it was very cold because it was in the winter and I was super excited to have it. And I came home and it wasn't here. Trevor called postal inspectors who learned there were similar complaints in the same area. The suspect identified um, apartment buildings that had vulnerabilities. Packages were simply left outside, they were unsecured, and he took advantage of that. When investigators found open packages in a nearby dumpster, they began to look at video camera footage. Once we identified the area where he was disposing of the items at this dumpster, we were able to capture video of him on these occasions. We also utilized the video from several of these apartment buildings where the thefts occurred. Inspectors were able to send the packages to a postal inspection service crime lab where fingerprints showed an exact match to a suspect. From the video, uh, from the times of delivery, we were able to develop some patterns and we were able to do surveillance and catch them red-handed. More than 30 victims lost 40 packages. Inspectors say the suspect would open the packages and sell the items immediately. Trevor says he thinks working professionals who aren't at home in the middle of the day are often targeted. Now, neighbors are helping neighbors. And if someone's here and they see packages in the hallway, they'll bring them in, put them in front of somebody's door, and then let you know if they see you or talk to you that you do have a package. Here's another new scheme, thanks to the internet age. Con men are trolling people who are looking for work. Here, the target is college-age students or young people in the childcare business and instead of making money, they're being left with additional debt. Meet one quick-thinking student who figured it all out just in the nick of time. Katrina McCosker is a law school student who also works as a nanny. Her resume is posted on childcare sites. So she was interested when she got an email from a family looking for help. And saying, hey, I'm moving to the United States. I'm from Ireland. My sister's looking for a nanny for her kids, and I thought it was a great opportunity. The email went to Katrina's personal email address, which was unusual. She was used to corresponding through the job sites, 
She assumed they got it off her resume. We want you to get our house in order, our affairs in order, before we get here, get the apartment set up. Both sides emailed back and forth for more than a month. So they sent a check for about $4,000 and they said, deposit this check and send the rest to our financial person. And it was cash. Katrina was told she should take $250 out as an initial payment. Which is a lot of money for literally receiving a check and sending money to someone else. So I thought, okay, 250 bucks to send money to your financial person for doing these little things for you? Sure. She made the deposit on her lunch break and then wired the remaining money. When she returned to work and mentioned the story to a colleague, he thought it sounded like a scam. I'm just stunned, I'm shocked. I can't believe that happened. I'm like, I lost thousands of dollars. I don't have thousands of dollars. That means I'm gonna have to take a semester off school, make up that money. I was just like in tears. Her colleague looks up how to call the wire service and because she acted quickly, they were able to stop payment. 10 minutes later, I got a call from a man, not a Irish woman, saying, you stop the money, what happened? We need that money. In hindsight, there were red flags, like they wouldn't give her any specific details except a vague address. I was so busy at the time, so close to the time that they were coming that I didn't even think to research and Google Maps it and see if the address existed. It was only after that I Google Mapped it and I was like, that's an empty field. Postal inspectors say these scams take many forms, like work at home opportunities and online auction site transactions. The best advice is to proceed with caution. Ask specific questions. Uh, be, ask for details on what their employment is, on what's expected of them. If you believe you've been a victim of fraud involving the U.S. mail, including work at home schemes, foreign lottery and sweepstakes scams, identity theft or charity or investment scam, file a complaint. You can go to deliveringtrust.com and click on report mail fraud at the top of the page.